Let's jump over to our new segment. <clears throat> Mr. Llama's Sports Show. Llama's Hot Takes. Oh, this should be fun. This is going to be a lot of fun. First topic of interest. Let me get my text. Llama's Hot Takes. I want Chat's Hot Takes, too. Houston Astros. Is it enough? Because I think this still needs to be talked about. Is it enough? We'll, we'll bounce through. We'll bounce through different topics. We're doing hot takes. Hot takes on sports. Is it enough? The Houston Astros were recently found to be cheating. They cheated through their World Series win and the World Series loss using cameras to watch the uh, opposing, basically the pitchers at like pitches, right? So the, the catcher gives a sign. They were using a camera to watch it. And then they would bang on a trash can, which for some reason they thought wouldn't get caught. I don't know. I don't know. They thought it wouldn't get caught as they banged on, banged on a can over and over again for the batters. So the batters knew what pitches were coming. And this led to them having much higher hit percentages, uh, being in much better positions, uh, all of this, and then they won the World Series, and uh, and then lost the next World Series, but still made it to the World Series. And Houston Astros, I'm gonna bring up YouTube stealing signs. Let's let's get a. I want I want like the audio. Banging trash can. Hey with that. That's not easy. That's here we go. And this is against my Rangers right here, so this is even more offensive. Let's bring it up. Oops. Twenty five minutes of it. And let's bring you there. I think a lot of teams will get caught in between when they Just go listen. through that rebuild. So listen for it. Let's get a couple names out here, some people, some players that fans will recognize, so they'll want to come out to the ballpark, so they'll want to tune in. But does that really help? Kind knows what's coming. Got kind of a contender here. It was ugly, mm. but I think in the back end of it, ring or not, World Series not or banging, not. knows what pitch is coming. The they use bang or not bang. Everything that they basically. Entails. See how this thing ends now over the next few years. They ultimately ended up trading to the Philadelphia. Go find some more very, stuff. Very, very good power. Oh. Bases strike three. Third strike. Two bay. Got to find where the booms. There we go. Of a ground ball right here. Give us a sign. The two double, one. double tap. Probably a slider of some sort. Third, six Astros today. It with the off day on Monday. That one's really loud. And back. And Gossett with the off day on Monday, still working on his. I mean. Rest. Yeah, we can go through. There's plenty, plenty of that stuff. So they did this. They did this stuff. Cheated through the entire season. Is that the two teams are colluding? No, it's that. The batting team is stealing the pitcher's sign. Remember, the catcher will, will give the sign to the pitcher of what pitch to pitch. This should be a lesson to all of us how important it is to encrypt your baseball signals That's right. with secure algorithms. That's right. So he will give the pitch to the pitcher, and then they're stealing that sign and then alerting their batters so the batter knows what pitch is coming. pretty messed up so after all of this Astros punishment
It was. Let's bring it right over here. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, they suspended the GM and manager for one year. Um, the Astros punishment includes a $5 million fine and a loss of their first and second round draft picks in 2020 and 2021. Enough? Not enough? Llama's hot take is that this is so far from enough. Join my army of the I think you got to do the death penalty. If you penalty. ain't cheating, you ain't trying. Not the physical, like, actually kill the people. But I'm talking about the NCAA death penalty implemented on SMU back in 1987. When they had all of their recruiting, uh, paying their recruits and all of that stuff. They canceled their season. They um, canceled their all, all their home games, and they ended up just forfeiting their away games and taking that stuff. They lost a bunch of scholarships for forty for four years. Uh, they were only allowed like a less like coaches and all of this stuff. Um, they had no off campus recruiting for a bit. All of these things, and. I and it, and it like destroyed the program. They went from like Heisman winning, like players, things like that, to like program got wrecked. It took them probably I think like twenty years until they won a bowl or made it to a bowl game, even something like that. And to me, the fact that one they're not even removing the title striking the winds, all of that stuff from the Astros alone is is such a shame. Because, like, and then on top of that, bigger fine, that might be, like, the fine maximum, though, something like that, but throwing fines at the players that were involved, uh, suspensions on those players, potential bans on, on players or, you know, anybody involved, like, they banned Pete Rose for life because he bet on his own team to win. And yet, an entire team cheats their way to win an entire World Series. And Make them play next year without mitts and bats. That'll teach them. No, just just five million dollar fine, couple couple draft picks here and there. Like, it's messed up. Do I think Altuve wore a buzzer? I don't know. I don't put it past him. But would I be objectively calling for the same punishment if it was my team? I have a Houston Astros shirt. <laughs> That's my second team. But now it's not. Now it's screw them. Like, So it's just right. Life in StarCraft 2 got the death penalty as well. I mean, <clears throat> you have to be severe in these cases. To me, this is the same thing that we see with companies and the government and you know apple made you know 500 million dollars by slowing down people's phones and then they get fined like 50 million dollars or 5 million dollars and so they go okay what does that tell us we should do that again by the way i don't those aren't accurate numbers but it's the thing where like all companies do these things get fined but the fine is less than the profits they made and in this case the Houston Astros and the punishment handed down to the Houston Astros just said every team should be trying to do this. Right? Every single team should now be trying to do this. Because what do you get? You lose four draft picks. I'm pretty sure most any team would trade two first round and two second round draft picks for a World Series championship and another World Series appearance. On top of that, $5 million and then like 
a year suspension for your GM and manager. There is not a team in the world that would not trade that for a World Series title. All team steal signs with the like second base players and things. But there is very clear evidence of Astros sign stealing with the, uh, <laughs> I mean, just everything, right? We literally just watched some of it. And player sign stealing is a lot harder. It's true. Um, Join my army of the they should be searched. Hashtag search me daddy. Let me find. Uh, there's, there's great, there's so many great, like, graphs and stuff, but there's one I'm looking for. I know. Um, anyways, yeah, so, right, you can have your player on second base trying to peek around being like, or whatever putting his left foot on the bag, right foot on the bag, all that stuff. But uh, when you have your dugout signaling, and that also is such a specific instance as well, where you're on, you have a player on second base. And most pitchers, this is the biggest thing. Most pitchers know if you got a guy on second base, you switch to a different sign with your catcher, right? You change the signs up so then, or you do, you know, whatever. So so that way it, they don't know and they can't signal it. When you don't know that they're stealing signs because they're using a camera in the outfield all of the time. Massive issues. Because now the, the pitchers don't know that their signs are being stolen. And so they aren't changing it up. But there were instances where they would actually go and change it up because they were like, it feels like the batters are predicting they'd like call their catcher out. And a lot of them talked about that afterwards. And they were like, yeah, we just like went to no sign or, you know, our different sign stuff because it felt like somebody was, you know, they somehow knew what we were throwing. So have to constantly cycle the signs. Yes, they ended up kind of having to constantly do that stuff, but whatever. So. I want to put a poll up for you guys, chat. Let's put a poll. Um, where is my poll button? Do I not have a poll button? Create a poll? Is that not on here? Manage your poll. There we go. And manage poll. New poll. Houston Astros. Punishment enough? Not enough. Um, enough. Or, yeah, that's good enough. Start the poll. Vote in the poll. Some people think it is enough. They think, you know what? If this is your team, Mr. Llama, you wouldn't be making that claim. You would say, hey, everybody cheats. Everybody's trying to steal signs. They just did it better. Or, you know what? It was a small thing. The team still deserved it. There, There is still the argument out there. And there's plenty of people that think, uh, that, think that way. I just personally cannot get behind that. The old Barry Bonds defense, right. They did use video tech. So, it's, uh, it's rough stuff. My problem is the monetary value of 5 mil doesn't mean anything to such a big team. It really doesn't. 5 million is, is nothing. Why is it illegal to steal signs? Because then the batter knows what's coming. Like, the whole point is the pitcher is throwing to the batter who doesn't know what's coming. And so he has to watch the pitch and, you know, all of that stuff. If he knows it's a slider, if he knows it's a curve, you know, whatever, if he knows it's a fastball, that's going to 
make it way easier for him to hit as we saw where once again their hit percentage and like on base percent all those things they had like historically high uh hitting and stuff looks like we got 91 percent with not enough nine percent though think enough interesting all right they just need to cheat better next time but given the punishment and the monetary net gain mm -hmm. it implies a marginal benefit in access of the cost um let's talk about running backs llama's hot take number two what should be done for the running back in football currently running backs are in such a a bad position it, it's yes this is handball american football let me put that i apologize basically they are these workhorses so they come in, they get their rookie contracts, they become workhorses for a team, they get run into the ground, and then they basically are destroyed before their sec their next contract comes up, or their big contract, what would be their big contract, comes up. And so you you have, we just saw Todd Gurley, who was one of the guys who got paid but now is broken. David Johnson now is broken. Ezekiel Elliott, not broken yet, did just get paid. What do you think is the best way to handle it? Shorten their rookie contracts? I, I think that that's something that they probably have to do. They, I, I think for the running back, they're going to just have to simply shorten their rookie contract so that they can actually come in, only have one franchise tag. I completely agree. What's a rookie contract? So when a player first comes into the league and they get drafted, they sign a rookie con contract. Okay. The and best way to handle it is, is pay them when four they are years, in college, when they are the right? most productive anyways. With a fifth year option. But the thing is, with running backs, they burn out before that, before that time comes. And then on top of that, you can franchise tag up to two times, I believe. So you can, a franchise tag is where you basically say, we're going to take you for one more year. We're going to pay you one more year uh, extension. And you pay them at the like market rate, essentially. So it's, it's expensive to franchise, but you're not having to give them a contract, right? So if a, if a running back comes out, you're not having to say, all right, we're going to commit to you for the next four or five years. You're saying, we're just going to do one more year. And, you know, sometimes it's <clears throat> let them prove some stuff out to see them some things, whatever. You can negotiate a deal during that time, blah, blah, blah. But like I say, with... Maybe there's run limits per game, like pitch counts. But the problem is the pitcher is very important to the team. This is the thing. The pitcher is the quarterback, right? If you have a good pitcher, you are great, and you personally care about taking care of that pitcher. You're not going to burn him out because you, you want him in, you know, to be on your team for a long time. Running backs are very kind of expendable, right? It's like... We've seen multiple teams go to Super Bowls, win Super Bowls that have just picked up random running backs and just kind of like brought them through the playoff and say, all right, here you go. Just hand the ball to them. So you can say a good running back might be more important than your QB, Saquon Barkley. I mean, obviously an amazing running back. And when you're comparing him to, you know, Eli Manning or now – uh, who's the new guy for the Giants? Um, but they didn't even get to the playoffs. And they had Saquon Barkley. 
Whereas there's other teams that have had very good quarterbacks. I would say Derrick Henry is probably the better running back to use for that. Because let's be honest, Tannehill was all right. He played fine. But Derrick Henry led that team through the playoffs, right? Through the season, through everything. Henry was an absolute beast. I I mean, some of some of those amazing runs. Daniel Jones, thank you. And yet, <laughs> Tannehill just signed for a large contract. And I think like 30 million a year at least. And uh, Henry is still waiting. He, he doesn't have a, any contract out for him yet. Probably going to get tagged and then dumped. It'll probably be franchise tag him, give him 400 touches, dump him. So I think they got to change it up. I, I think they honestly need to take it and just change it up and just go back to, um, like you say, three years rookie contract, two years rookie contract, one year franchise for a running back. Give the guy the contract early enough in his career before he gets burned out so you also can't just burn him out because that's the thing. Right now, you go four years, and then I know they just signed the CBA, right? You go four years, and then you have the option of that fifth year, and then tag, right? And by the end of that, a running back's career is basically over, for the most part. But if you go two years, and then you have the one-year tag, well, now you're in that weird spot where it's like, okay, a running back at three years can still be productive for another few years. You can still get two, three years out of them, maybe. Then uh, maybe I I think that would be the best way to do it because I think that would force teams to kind of give contracts in that time. And it would allow the player to just not be burned out by that time. And it would also maybe make teams consider not burning running backs out because that's kind of the problem is teams know that they're just going to lose their running back. He's going to burn out and break down like we saw with Gurley. And so they say, okay, well, we don't, we aren't going to bother trying to limit his touches. We're just going to burn him, you know, use him as much as we can until he, until he's just dead (laughs) until his legs and everything gives out. So, That's the biggest thing the running back position needs to evolve and change. See, I think this is the... Obviously, there's there's some of that. And I think we'll go right here and we'll go American football and we'll change it from running backs to overall play style slash rules. Football. This is Lama's hot take. Football needs to be better with their rules. Maybe that's not a hot take. Football needs to remove a lot of rules and be more consistent in others. It's a lukewarm take. My least favorite thing watching a football game right now is every time a touchdown is scored looking for the flag how awful is it that you can never just cheer when it's scored right like you don't see that in other sports You, you just don't, you don't see that in other sports. In hockey, when the puck goes in the net, everybody freaks out and cheers. In soccer, I guess you have VAR now, so you kind of do a little bit. 
but like you're pretty certain on most things and it is kind of the problem with with var though it brings more consistency to the complete accuracy of the game which is nice but there's also really weird things with var like there was a recent game with dc united against uh who are they playing They were playing another team, and the team was up 1-0, and then they went down and scored, and then they played for, like, two or three more minutes, and then suddenly the ref goes like that, the sign for VAR, and he heads over, takes away the goal from the other team, and, like, moves all the way back, because there was a penalty, like, but it was, yeah, against Miami, there you go, and it was so confusing, and it was just like, not, the implementation is not great. Do you actually watch games? <laughs> what? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, and yeah, I'm sure it's a very big topic in European football. But like, in the NFL, it is, there's so many rules and so many things happening all the time that it ends up being a big problem. And once again, yes, in hockey, they review, like you have these things, but it's not at all in the same manner. When my hockey team scores, that goal is sticking a majority of the time, unless, you know, somebody got knocked into the goalie or something, and then you kind of, there's that sort of like debate. But for the most part, or somebody was offside, you know, sometimes there's some trash ones where, like, they were offsides two minutes ago when they entered the zone. Kicking the puck. Right, you have your things, but a majority of the time, it's fine. You're not looking around going, did somebody on the opposite side of the field hold somebody a little bit? And that was, it just was was too much. And... For me, it's it's really just killing football. And the problem is, it might not even be the problem is the flag. The problem is the penalty itself is so severe that referees get to decide the game. Straight up, referees have way too much influence in a football game. And it's and it's absolutely a mess. And and I I hate it. Because you can take let's say that my team has third and eighteen. And we go back to throw the ball and we try and throw it seven yards and our the receiver gets held a little bit. It's now a f automatic first down. And it's like, really? At the same time, if your team gets a holding penalty, first and 10 suddenly becomes first and 20, and that really is difficult. Or second and 20, you know, if you if it's second down, second and 10, second and 20. And suddenly that basically kills a drive. You have to make these like, it's it's, I don't want to say a miracle for teams to be able to get 20 yards in a single set of downs but it it the conversion rate definitely goes down for sure probably not kurt and uh and so all of the penalties pass interference penalties holding penalties you have all of your like how people can line up penalties and so oh this guy was you know he stepped back off the line and so you get a flag for that and then obviously you don't have consistency in your calls as well. Some refs call it super tight. Other refs let them play. Sometimes in a game, they're just back and forth. And all of this comes at such a such extreme penalties and drive killers that it's like, who's actually playing this game? Is it the refs or is it the team? Because you can have refs make a couple calls and just 
get a team all the way down to the red zone. Right? And so it's just a complete mess. I think they either need to A, remove some rules, let players line up however they want, you know, do things like that, you know, loosen up on other things. I don't know. Figure some stuff out. Allow for some jostling or grab whatever. And it's it's hard because the sport itself just leads to like every play being so important and thus penalties being so important and everything like that. Um, but if you follow the rules, everything is fine, right? Wrong. Players are actually taught to hold, but like in ways that won't get caught exactly. And so if you're not somewhat holding and stuff, your line's not going to be as effective. So it's just, it's just bad. It's not a flag unless you get caught. That's essentially it. And so there's so many rules and it just really ruins the flow. And so I think either make penalties less impactful or make there are less penalties. And yeah, you get things like invalid, ineligible receiver downfield. There's a million just weird penalties too that just show up here and there. And it's like they're trying to do so much stuff. So I don't know. Maybe there's ways they need to change it around, but I'm not sure what the solution is. But I think it needs to... I think it needs to be changed because... Too many games, too many games get determined and, and set up from all of that. Um, XFL. Let's talk about the XFL. First off, kind of unfortunate that in the XFL's first season, the XFL is like an offshoot of the NFL. And I, I want to read and make sure we get... Get this right. Yeah. Professional American Football League, owned by Vince, McMah Vince McMahon. Uh, they have eight teams. And they began this year. And it's the successor of the original XFL. Which was back in 2001. So they have a 10-game season, two-week postseason. Though right now, obviously, they're going through coronavirus stuff. And, uh, yeah, so just a new, new football league that tries to change things up. And let's go to the rule changes. So they've removed the kickoff, which I love, because once again, the kickoff is also just a terrible thing in football. And so they've, well, they haven't removed it. They've removed the giant run uh, of it and instead the spot of the kick the kickoff is at the team's 30 yard line but then all of the players start up basically at the front and have to wait for the guy to catch the ball so it's a lot less of this like running the full field and getting all of because everybody was just getting so injured and stuff oh i agree tish um so I do like that part. Uh, they have two different kind of touchbacks. Major, when a kick travels in the end zone in the air, which results in the receiving team taking possession at the 35. And a minor touchback occurs when the ball bounces into the end zone. So it discourages teams from purposely taking a touchback, which once again is the, like all that people do in the NFL now. Either everybody runs full force and hits, which doesn't happen too often, or I wonder what the percentage is, but so many people just take the touchback all the time. And it's like the most boring thing in football. So this actually discourages you from kicking a touchback. And it encourages just kind of the short field mashup, which is nice. Um, the extra point is also removed. And it, it's replaced with a one, two, or three point line which i think is also very interesting because 
once again, the extra point is just like a boring part of football, right? <laughs> also, for the onside kick, um, they do... Okay, no, they're doing that. Okay. Never mind. So they can do it, but it's... I don't know if runners can run or not for that. Because the current onside kick is also really bad. A touchdown is worth six. You can get seven, eight, or nine points, depending on if you go for a one, two, or three-point conversion. Did they change? do these rule changes in the NFL to avoid concussions? They haven't done any kickoff rule changes in the NFL, except people just take touchbacks a lot more, and they made it a 25-yard touchback or whatever. And they did the thing where you have to start standing next to the ball. You can't get a run with it, which ruined a lot of onside kicks. Yeah, and so they actually tested the 4th and 15 um, NFL onside kick in the... Or they talked about it. I don't know if it went through. They tested it in the All-Star game? Maybe they tested it there. I think so. Um, overtime is also decided by a five-round shootout of two-point conversions, similar to a penalty shootout in soccer or ice hockey, which I think is also a fabulous addition to the game. Because, once again, the overtime rules kind of stink in the NFL. It kind of sucks that one team can go down and score a touchdown, and then the game's over and the other team doesn't even get the ball. Because if you have if you have two teams that are just having an offensive battle, it's like, who wins the coin toss? A gift for you. Love you, Mr. Llama. Thank you, Teddy Bear. Welcome back for four months. And then additionally, the clock runs continuously in the game outside of the two-minute warning. It only stops during chance of possession. Um, and then the play clock is 25 seconds long. So instead of the 40 for the NFL. So it's a lot like faster pace of play as well, which I think is also really good. So I love the XFL. They've only they only had a few games there, but uh I thought it was great. I thought that and there's other changes as well. Yeah, the clock stops when they're placing it too, exactly. Um how much did I watch? I watched two Dallas games and then I watched like the highlights of the other games. So I just thought it felt like it played better. The the pace was definitely better. And then just the the changes that they made, such as the extra point of one, two, three, the you know, the kickoffs, like all of those things just felt like Oh, yeah, maybe this game did need some updates. Maybe football wasn't perfect in its rule set and, and, you know, perfect when it was created and stuff. Because I feel like when you go to a lot of other games, it's like, don't change them, right? Like soccer. I don't think soccer really needs too much change to it. It's it's very well done, um, you know. And we've seen, but there's still, we've seen some, some changes, obviously. And we've seen changes in like hockey. They've, they've made some changes there. The biggest thing with soccer is embellishment. <laughs> so that can be our next hot take. The league... What do you think about NHL changes regarding goalie equipment? Uh, maybe needs to be a little smaller. I feel like goalies are too good right now. 
Or did they just make it smaller? Because it was getting really big. I haven't kept up exactly with what they've done there. Um, XFL has zero known players, though, which makes it boring to you. But the games are so fun to watch. They really are. Even if you, like, don't know many of the players, like, it's actually really fun to watch. They did make it smaller. Good. It was needed. Goalies are, have gotten so good, and with giant pads, they were just – it was just too much. They just had to kind of swell up, and they were fine. Um Soccer embellishment is the most embarrassing thing I have ever watched in a sport. And I am absolutely amazed and astounded that people continue to watch soccer games with how much embellishment there is. And I'm also so surprised at how little they've done to mitigate it. Like, in hockey, players started embellishing a little bit, and then they just started, like, handing out suspensions, like, one-game suspensions, whatever stuff, to the players, and then they just stopped embellishing. Like... Let's see. <laughs> and so it's it's one of those things where you just it, they do it because it works because it's not taken control of. So here is Mr. Lama's soccer solution. After the fact, in a game, all tackles will be reviewed. Then, the league will hand out retroactive cards and or retroactive points of some sort to players that have dove or embellished. And these will simply add up to suspensions and things of that nature, of course. Um, as you continue. So the next time you're going and a player comes in to tackle you, you can flop and maybe get the call right there. But at the end of the game, have some officials go through and just mark it up. Four points, you're out for the next match. Sure. Whatever it is. And then, yeah, you just throw monetary fines and suspensions on a can, on an escalating scale. And you're good to go. I feel like it's hard to judge in soccer. It's not, though. It's not. Because, one... Look at how many players I go down. Enforcement of injuries. <laughs> if you fake having a broken leg, then the team doc is bringing a hammer with them to make sure you have a broken leg, Kappa. There you go. You can, whenever you go on a replay, you can always tell if a guy is faking going down or not. Additionally, you can always tell if he's faking his injury when he's rolling around like he's dying, grabbing his knee, and and then he stands up and runs around and, and you know, sprints to the next ball, right? And you say the referee could penalize for embellishment and they have profess professional refs to do this and stuff, but they're not working. It's not happening. <laughs> That's the thing. The referee can do this, but the referee is not doing this. And one, it's because it's really hard as a referee. You have to cover the entire field, which a soccer pitch is huge. The ball travels quickly around it. And so you're having to see things from not always the best angle. You're having to see it from far away at full speed. It's really difficult. And uh, so obviously if the referee catches you embellishing, then yes, he will... He will uh, give you a card. But players have gotten very good at doing that. 
at making it look like there was. And it just leads to terrible soccer. That's all it does. It leads to terrible soccer. And I hate it. I I I love watching soccer games so much, but I hate watching professional soccer because all of the players are so good at diving. You just can't respect it. You can't respect the players. You can't respect the sport. You can't respect, yeah, they're rolling around like they're all dying and, you know, hands on the face, like they're crying their eyes out. And, and it's just pathetic to watch. It is absolutely so pathetic. And yeah, and a lot of it's in the culture of it and all of it, but just start throwing out suspensions. And I think all of a sudden you're going to have a better game. Start doing post-game reviews of every tackle. That's it. I think you. I think if you implement that, all of a sudden the players will suddenly shape up and nobody's going to go down anymore unless they actually go down. And then you'll fix things up. I don't know why they have not tried anything like this. Why they're so okay with their sport being made a mockery of. I don't know. But it's uh, it's really disappointing for me, to me. I know they have multiple cameras. They always get it. They always show the highlight of the player and then you see that it's a dive but by that point the call's already been made the card's been given out to the other guy all that stuff it's just the u.s that hates soccer and mocks it the u.s doesn't hate soccer a lot of people in, in america like soccer but i don't i don't think anybody in the world enjoys watching flop dive ball like we're seeing yeah, even the NBA does a better job of penalizing flops. And they don't do a great job of it. <laughs> so. That brings us to our next topic. Speaking of the NBA. The three-pointer. The Splash Bros. The change in the game. Has it ruined basketball? Has it ruined basketball? Because basketball before used to be this game that you could watch and it had a lot of plays to 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 drive the basket a lot more people moving and and just kind of the flow of the game was very different they didn't change basketball basketball changed in itself because of the three pointer because people just started getting too good essentially and shooting it just became this thing where it was like okay it's more effective for us to just step up and shoot a three-pointer than to try and work hard and you know get inside to get a a two-point shot so first off the two-point jump shot is just completely gone out of the game nobody lines up in that two-point jump shot range everybody's either on the three-point art or in the center And, well, they do that, Tella. Everybody in basketball is tall. And so it's kind of been one of those things that is a a two-point thing. The first one is players have gotten too good at shooting. And so now they can just drain threes all the time. And the second thing is... um, Players... Or the... What was number two? All right. Well, that's the thing. Players have gotten too good. Oh, yeah. And the second thing is statistics have also gotten very good. And basically, 
it's kind of been moneyballed a little bit, right? Like in baseball where it was like, okay, it's taking the three pointer is always going to be the better, like people lining up and taking those two point shots, jump shots. It's not worth it anymore. Sorry. And so statistically, it's like always better to just take the three point shot. And so that's what players are doing. So they just line up there, take your three point shot. But the game has just really become less entertaining to watch. And and I, I would, you know, I would question or ask, what do you guys think, if you think so, is the proper way to make basketball more entertaining again? Because... It just, play, you know, it, it, the plays, the set plays and stuff just aren't a thing anymore. It's, it's very, if you do drive in, it's just to kick out to the three-point line. And that's kind of it there. Depends on what you consider more entertaining. I suppose it's to get it more towards a classic basketball. And maybe you like basketball in its current state. Maybe you say, you know what? The three-point line is great. I love watching people step up and drain threes from 25 feet and whatever, and it's it's all good. But get rid of the corner three. I think that's definitely a possibility of it. I think corner threes are definitely... If you removed corner threes, it would change up so much of the game because then you're you're crowding too much around the three-point line if you're just on the arc and so people aren't just going to be like all on that you'll have people actually starting to move through i think that's that's not a bad idea and there's probably some scientific answer for that but it's true the number of players that can make corner threes is very high Lack of fundamental skills in the mid-range shot, especially in the oh-so-prevalent stretch-forward position. But the but why would you even want to develop someone with that skill? I think that's the thing. It's who cares if you can shoot a two-point jump shot? The three-point is is so much more valuable. You just need more skill now. See, I think it's less skill. I think it's just be a good three-point shooter, which is a skill, but it's a very one-dimensional skill. Add a zone around the three-point line that you can't stay in. My only thought would be that might drive too much ref because you can't stay in the paint, and then you can't stay in that zone. That's like almost too much. I don't disagree, but I don't know how to go back. It's hard. It's hard. Add more baskets like Quidditch. Exception everything in fashion right now is actually has a reliable mid-range shot. I mean, you're going to have exceptions to the rule, but the general thing is not that. And like LeBron James um, shooting chart. Year by year. Ah, let's do heat map. See if I can get this. Because it's very interesting. And you can see it. You can see the trend. For sure. Basketball reference. That's right. 
Let me bring this, do this. There you go. I think this is a pretty accurate portrayal, kind of as it goes. Where it just kind of becomes this zone on this outside. You're either right here or you're shooting in these spots. And obviously he's not shooting a lot of like corner threes and stuff. The Predator playing basketball? Yes. I am very happy with the Mavs and what they have. Trust me. I am a huge Mavericks fan. Very excited. But... You know, I don't know. I, I think this is a tough a tough problem to address, but I do think the game of basketball has become worse. Dirk Nowitzki is the opposite of what I talk about. Yeah, but he was in the previous era. He was before the three three point shot came around. Like really became, you know, the Steph Curry, the the clay right, the the standard now. That's been over the last like few years. So, and our last hot take of the day, the Olympics. How have they not canceled these yet? How, like, who is going to show up? And it's not just the Olympics as well. There are track, the the track meet for my, like the, the overarching group for the districts and state and all of that stuff in Texas hasn't even canceled all of the track stuff. They're talking about, well, maybe... We can get the kids one meet in and then have the district and state meet. We could still run those. What? What are you talking about? Nobody's been training. People are out of shape. Like, you're going to have people come back and have one meet to qualify for state? It's going to be the worst competition ever. And then you have the Olympics where you have a bunch of these amazing athletes who have just watched all of these NBA and NFL, whatever players, well, a lot of the NBA players who were playing together have Corona and they're like, hmm, yes. I for one, look forward to the 2020 Olympics brought to you by Microsoft Teams <laughs> VRKEKW. And uh, I, I just have no clue how it is not canceled yet. Who's going to show up to that? Who is willingly, what athlete is willingly going to show up to the Olympics? Put themselves at risk. I don't know. I think they need to just move it a year. Cancel it or just move it to 2021. And we're just kind of canceling all of 2020. But they got to they got to do something with it. I don't know why it's still a thing. So anyways, that is Llama's hot takes everybody. I appreciate you guys hanging out and chatting. Chat had a lot of good hot takes as well. I'm actually very impressed. I'm actually very impressed. I appreciate you guys uh, participating and joining in the discussion. 